When it comes to Batman storylines, there is none better than the 1986 classic The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. It took one of DC's flagship heroes that had been oversaturated with campy and kid-friendly tones since the 1960s and returned him to his dark and gritty roots. It challenged what we knew about the hero up until that point, as well as other notable characters featured in the story, which I will get to. There was a lot to unpack with this storyline, so let's just dive right in, shall we? I could talk about this comic all day. Beginning with Issue 1, The Dark Knight Returns. We start our story with a newscast, introducing the new gang in Gotham City, known as the Mutants, who have brutally murdered three nuns. They've even threatened to end the life of James Gordon, who is retiring as the police commissioner in four weeks. It's also the 10th anniversary of the last known sighting of the Batman. Anyone too young to have seen him in the flesh believe Batman to be a myth, nothing more, nothing less. There has also been debate on whether his one-man vigilante war on crime was good or bad for Gotham City. We cut to an older Bruce Wayne, now 40, having a drink with Gordon. The two reminisce on the good old days, and Bruce explains that he hasn't spoken to Dick Grayson in seven years, after what happened to Jason Todd. Bruce then departs and walks home alone. I leave my car in the lot. I can't stand to be inside anything right now. I walk the streets of this city I'm learning to hate, the city that's given up, like the whole world seems to have. I'm a zombie, a flying Dutchman, a dead man, ten years dead. Bruce goes to the site of his parents' murder and explains that if it didn't happen then, it could have easily happened now. He could be standing over his parents as we speak. Bruce gets attacked by a group of mutants, but they refuse to kill him because he seems to be enjoying it. Arkham is now more of an old age home than it is an eccentric asylum. We see that Harvey Dent has been cured, deemed psychologically fit to return to society. He wants to dedicate himself to public service and doesn't expect the people of Gotham to forgive him for what he's done as Two-Face. Bruce has a nightmare involving his parents and falling down the hole which led to the cave filled with bats. The horrifying image of the bat, the fiercest warrior and purest warrior as he puts it, fills his mind and he awakes. The bat cave calls to him, it wants him, but Bruce reminds himself of the promise he gave after the death of Jason. Never again. Alfred, who must now be close to 112, calls Bruce out of the Batcave to let the past be. He also realizes Bruce has shaved off his mustache, to which Bruce seems shocked, almost as if he has done it without realizing, like a force of old habit. Harvey Dent has mysteriously disappeared and he returns to the members of his old gang with a completely bandaged up face. As Bruce Wayne watches television late at night, he comes across The Mark of Zorro, the movie he had seen with his parents the night they were killed. It causes him to recollect the events leading up to their murder. As he flips through the channels, he sees heinous crime after heinous crime committed by the mutant gang. Kidnapped children, senseless murder, rape, he's had enough. Something must be done about it. As he looks out the window, he envisions the same bat from his nightmares smashing through it. As a woman gets attacked, a strange figure smashes through the glass and eliminates him, quickly and without warning, like a bolt of lightning. As a criminal terrorizes a cab driver and holds a woman hostage, a large foot disarms him. Two young girls, Michelle and Carrie, cut through an arcade and are confronted by a group of mutants. Before they can attack, they are pumped full of batarangs. One is even electrified by string lights. Reports come in of a large man or bat-like creature that has brutalized several members of the mutant gang. Broken bones, lacerations, you name it. The Batman has seemingly returned to the fight. Despite his age, he should feel broken. Instead, he feels like a new man. Young again. Reborn. The Joker watches the news reports from the comfort of Arkham. After seeing that Batman has returned, so does his smile. After a rough night out, Bruce Wayne gets some much needed massaging and realigning by Alfred, before Commissioner Gordon calls him. The mutant leader sends a message to Batman over the television sets. He promises that his men will kill Gordon. He himself will defeat Batman and drag his body through the streets, and that Gotham City belongs to him and his gang. 
They are the future. Gordon decides to have the bat signal put back on the roof of the Gotham police station. As Carrie looks out the window while her parents do drugs, she sees the bat signal for the first time. Batman meets with Gordon about two military helicopters that had been stolen. Batman goes to Gotham's Twin Towers to stop the criminals, and hopes the man responsible isn't Harvey Dent. The helicopters begin firing on Gotham City. One lands on one of the towers, and Batman disposes of the goons using a type of fear gas, only to find a bomb inside. Harvey Dent is atop the other tower, and tells Gotham he plans on detonating the devices. Thankfully, Batman has his trusty sniper rifle, and aims it at the other rooftop. He fires a cable and begins walking across it, only to be shot in the chest and falls. His left arm becomes numb, and he believes it might be a heart attack. Batman hooks onto Harvey's chopper by firing another cable, and the shifting weight causes Dent to fall out. He catches Dent though, and his fears have been realized. Dent is still the same. His alter ego of Two-Face is upset, feeling the world is laughing at his face now, rather than be disgusted by it. When Dent asks Batman to look at him, he tells Dent that he merely sees his reflection. Moving on to the second issue, The Dark Knight Triumphant. As a fan of Batman with neglectful parents, Carrie decides to don the costume of Robin, the Boy Wonder, while we overhear that James Gordon has shot and killed a 17-year-old mutant who attempted to kill him. As Gordon is questioned by reporters, the newscasters remind us of the mutant leader's message from weeks ago, and everyone asks who will become James Gordon's replacement as the new commissioner of the GCPD. We then see that little Kevin Ridley, heir to the Ridley chewing gum fortune, has been kidnapped by mutants who are demanding a $1 million ransom. A bat flies out from behind a door and scares one of them, while the other fires at what he believes is Batman, killing his fellow gang member in the process. Batman breaks through the wall behind him, steals his gun, and fires at the mutant, threatening to kill the child. Kevin is saved, and the mutant is, well, dead. That's right, Batman is killed with a gun. At least, that's what it looks like. Batman interrogates one of the mutants to learn where they are getting their military-grade firearms. Carrie tries to follow some of them in another part of the city, in the hopes of finding Batman. The Dark Knight hops into his Batmobile to take it out for a test drive, wait until you see it, it's awesome. Jim Gordon's replacement is revealed as Captain Ellen Yindel, whose first act as commissioner is to issue an arrest warrant for Batman, viewing him as a criminal. Batman confronts the mutant leader at the city dump, where they have held up. The leader orders his men to attack police headquarters and to bring him the head of James Gordon, before Batman fires his weapon. The Dark Knight reveals himself in a massive bat tank, and begins firing shells on the mutant crowd. There's no way some of them survived, right? Well, Batman does say they are rubber bullets, kind of like an Arkham Knight, but here, it could just be some sick humor. He makes his way through the mutants, and reaches their leader. There he is, the mutant leader. A kind of evil we never dreamed of. There he is, square in my sights and there's only one thing to do about him that makes any sense to me. Just press the trigger and blast him from the face of the earth. Though that means crossing a line I drew for myself 30 years ago. I can't think of a single reason to let him live. Wait a minute, I thought they were rubber bullets. How can they be fatal? I mean, he's closer than the other mutants were to the barrel of the tank, but still, I feel the others would have died as well, who at the very least, would have been given life-threatening injuries. What? They just lie there and succumb to their wounds? Are you sure they were rubber bullets, Batman? Is there something you aren't telling us? Anyways, Batman sees that the mutant leader is young, in prime physical condition, almost wishing he were more like him. Through jealousy and pride, he decides to take him on, though he feels he might not be able to win. As Batman fights the mutant leader, he realizes he may be too slow. He manages to break his nose, but the odds begin to go in favor of the mutant. The criminal grabs a crowbar and beats Batman with it, who goes into a state of confusion because of it. He believes Dick Grayson has come to save him, though it's really Carrie who has come to his aid. As she distracts the mutant leader, Batman manages to throw a smoke bomb in his face so they can escape. Carrie provides Batman with a sling and splint for his injured arm and shoulder as the Bat-Tank makes its way back to the Bat-Cave. 
In his delirium, Bruce accepts that she is in fact Robin. Dr. Wolper, the psychologist who helped Harvey Dent and is against everything Batman represents, asks if the Joker could accompany him on live TV to give his own viewpoint on the matter. The mayor of Gotham meets with the mutant leader in an interrogation room in the hopes of raising voter numbers, only for the hulking criminal to break free and rip out the mayor's throat with his teeth. As the next commissioner walks past a bunch of mutants, they tell her that she is next. The city is willing to negotiate with the mutant gang in the hopes of preventing a war. Fixing his arm with the best he can, Batman heads back out and believes Carrie is perfect as the next Robin and will be invaluable in his war against the mutants. Her first mission with him is to disguise herself as one of the mutants. If she messes it up in any way, he won't train her. She is to lure as many members of the gang as she can to one location, the Pipe, at West River and Forty. Batman is doing this so he can fight the mutant leader once more, this time with an audience. When he is defeated, the army will lose due to their unwavering loyalty to their master. They will be defeated through humiliation. Batman releases the mutant leader from prison and tells him he has to crawl his way out through a vent. The leader goes all the way to the end of the pipe where the Dark Knight is waiting, or at least his cape is. With both of them knee deep in mud, they are on the same playing field now. The mutant leader's speed has been compromised. Batman manages to weaken his foe until he's laying down in the mud and then breaks several of his limbs. With the Dark Knight victorious, countless members of the mutant gang switch sides and become vigilantes in Batman's image, calling themselves Sons of the Batman. Alright, on to Hunt the Dark Knight. Before we get into this issue, I have to bring up something that had happened earlier in the storyline that I didn't want to mention until now. Batman has returned and his actions are becoming even more unchecked than they were before. Times have changed and his former vigilanteism doesn't have a place in Gotham, let alone the world. He's poisoned by vengeance and taking things a bit too far this time. So the president has sent Superman to talk him down, by aggressive means if necessary. Batman's followers, whether his intention or not, are murdering criminals all over the city in the name of Batman. Some believe he should be held accountable for each and every life taken. Clark Kent confronts Bruce at his ranch and tells him to stop his crusade, and that eventually he will be forced to take Bruce in. Wayne doesn't budge an inch though and responds by saying, may the best man win. Superman has become a lapdog for the United States government, the personal errand boy of the president. He reveals that all the heroes like Wonder Woman and Green Lantern gave up their missions on Earth because of the complications it caused among its people. The newly appointed Commissioner Yindel attempts to arrest Batman after having released an arrest warrant for the vigilante. He ends up being forced to fight the police, but manages to escape their clutches thanks to Robin in a cloaked Batcopter. The Joker and his psychiatrist go on stage and he threatens to kill everyone in the audience. A doll that was created by Humpty Dumpty flies into the studio and breaks the psychiatrist's neck. Before the Clown Prince of Crime rides it out as its toxic laughing gas fumes fill the air, killing everyone there. As Batman and Robin go on the hunt for the Joker, the police are hot on their tails. Time seems to be running out for the Batman. The heroes confront the Joker at an amusement park where Batman throws a batarang into his eye and reveals his intentions. This ends tonight. He takes no prisoners. Batman fights the Joker in the Hall of Mirrors and then chases him into the Tunnel of Love where he breaks his archenemy's neck. It doesn't kill him though, just paralyzes him and the Joker is left disappointed. He uses his last bit of movement to finish the job and end his own life. Batman is left in the Tunnel of Love with the body of the Joker and is mortally wounded from the fight. Finally, we have arrived at the Dark Knight Falls, the final issue of the storyline. Batman evades the police by rigging an explosive device on Joker's body. Thankfully, Robin arrives with the Batcopter before they manage to capture the Dark Knight. Though some of the evidence is a bit muddled, the city believes Batman straight up killed the Joker. He has crossed a line and can't go back. Superman will have to stop him now. 
The country of Corto Maltese, where America has stuck its nose where it doesn't belong, and used Superman as a deterrent to subdue an uprising, has turned bad, as the Soviet Union, allies of the rebels, have fired a nuclear warhead at the US. Superman manages to stop it in time, but it explodes in a desert and disrupts all electronics in the Western Hemisphere, leaving all of Gotham in a blackout. With a possible nuclear war on the horizon with the defenseless United States, Batman puts on his cowl and realizes what Superman has done. Planes begin crashing into buildings, mass hysteria ensues. On horseback, Batman persuades the son of Batman to fight for him, with him, his way. He meets with more mutants who had escaped from prison, and they join his cause too. Superman is left weakened due to the nuclear explosion, which has blocked out the sun. He manages to reach organic life and drains it of the sun's energy to heal himself. Batman and his allies try to subdue the rioting caused by the bomb and get as many of the Gothamites as they can to put out fires, help wherever they are needed. A week later, Gotham is still in the dark, with nuclear ash covering the skies and blanketing out the sun. Bruce meets with Oliver Queen, who had escaped prison years prior, and wants to help Batman any way he can, seeing as he lost his arm due to a battle with Superman. The Man of Steel uses heat vision to ask Batman where they will meet. The vigilante responds with, Crime Alley. Batman suits up and prepares for what might be his last fight. He takes a special pill that will cause him to go into cardiac arrest within an hour at midnight. On Superman's approach, Batman activates missiles to see if Clark is still at full speed, or if the nuke has left him weakened. It has. As Batman checks the time, Superman is ambushed by Robin in the Bat Tank, but Robin is quickly disposed of. Batman hits Superman with a sonic gun, which causes a nosebleed. He then hooks himself up to the city's power and electrocutes Superman. Clark removes the protective helmet Bruce has been wearing, and the two continue to fight. Batman says that Superman sold them out, giving them the power that should have been theirs. Superman breaks three ribs of Batman and he is left weakened against the bent streetlight. Batman distracts Superman with acid to the face, long enough for Oliver Queen to fire his special kryptonite arrow. It explodes in Superman's face and severely weakens him. We could have changed the world. Now, look at us. I've become a political liability, and you? You're a joke. I want you to remember, Clark, in all the years to come, in your most private moments, I want you to remember my hand at your throat. I want you to remember the man who beat you. Batman dies in Superman's arms, and Alfred burns down Wayne Manor before succumbing to old age himself and dying. Batman is revealed as Bruce Wayne to the masses, and those that attend his funeral, like James Gordon and Selina Kyle, know the man responsible for his death, Superman. As Clark leaves, he hears a faint heartbeat. Realizing the woman standing over Bruce's grave is Robin, he gives her a wink. We cut to a cave, far from the remains of the last, where Bruce Wayne is starting anew. He intends to train his army, the next wave of Gotham protectors. At his side is Oliver Queen, and he accepts his new life, a quieter life. The Dark Knight Returns is without a doubt one of the best comic book stories I have ever read. It's received critical acclaim since its publication, and is widely considered to be not only the very best Batman story ever written, but one of the best in the entire medium that is comic books. Though the art style has never been one of its strongest suits in my opinion, the writing by Frank Miller is immaculate. The pacing is perfect all throughout, never are you faced with a dull moment, you're always engaged, and everything that happens reinforces the story and themes. With that said, there have been several negative reviews of this storyline over the years as well, but if I were to be completely honest, it's usually from those who have either not taken the time to actually sit back and read the story from start to finish, people who just want to go against the masses and hate on it in spite, don't have a firm grasp on its sensual themes, or are upset at the mistreatment of its heroes, Superman and Batman, that the comic goes against what they both represent. The last argument really makes me laugh because that's the whole point of the story. What comic were you reading? 
The Dark Knight Returns is a Batman story through and through, but it analyzes two of the biggest superheroes of all time, reaching the lowest points of their respective crime-fighting careers. Age has not been kind to either of them. Bruce Wayne returns to his life as a vigilante, poisoned by vengeance, and due to his age and limitations, is forced to take shortcuts, some of which eventually lead him into trouble. Superman has become the errand boy for the United States government. Rather than act independently, he is taken aside and does whatever his superiors tell him to do, which also results in its own set of problems. Times have changed and their form of heroism doesn't work anymore. Superman even says it himself. He had to do what he did in order to keep helping people in that way. The heroes of the world, presumably the members of the Justice League, became so big and godlike that the little people, the human race, began to feel too small. They began hating them as a result. And with this in mind, I feel The Dark Knight Returns is one of the more realistic DC storylines out there, because if Superman, Batman, and the rest of the Justice League were real, I feel this is how they would be treated. We would want them dead or contained in some way. We'd be afraid of their power. And with a power as strong as Superman's, you can damn sure believe that countries such as the United States would try to control him. I mean, he's a living, breathing weapon. Of course they would. I think Frank Miller has a firm grasp on who Batman is as a character and the motivations found within Bruce Wayne to be him. After his retirement from crime fighting, you feel this emptiness within Bruce's life. Just like he says he's a flying Dutchman, a ghost of sorts, the city calls to him. The comic begins with Bruce in a race car, causing it to crash in order to win a race, or at least try to. He knows the crash will happen, he knows he might die, but wants to prevail regardless. He's an adrenaline junkie that needs his fix, which is now missing, because he is no longer Batman. In many ways, Bruce wants to die. He wants a noble death. When he returns as Batman, the skills come back almost instantly, like a form of muscle memory. It's like he hasn't missed a beat. With that said, the mind doesn't line up with the body. His speed has been compromised, so is his strength. It forces him to take shortcuts to win, some righteous, others a little unethical. When he fights the mutant leader for the first time, it's the result of jealousy more than anything. It clouds his judgment and results in his defeat, almost death. Even at the start of the story, when he is attacked by those mutants in Crime Alley, he feels almost helpless, defenseless. Another reason Bruce ends up donning the cowl once again. Ever since this storyline's release, there has been debate over whether or not Batman killed anyone in it. While the story goes out of its way to explain that he hasn't, leading up to the Joker's death it really hammers that point home, there are a few inconsistencies I want to bring up that make me question it. First of all, when Batman rescues that boy who was taken hostage, he clearly shoots that mutant with the machine gun, and in the next panel we see that he is slumped over and the wall behind him is covered in what can only be blood. There is no mention as to whether or not this mutant survived those shots in the comic. Even if he lived, he could have been critically injured from those wounds and bled out right there. Later on in the story, Batman does mention that by killing, he would cross a line he drew 30 years ago, which means the apparent death of the mutant holding the kid must not have been fatal. Even still, its depiction in the artwork isn't very clear. If they really wanted him to live, wouldn't they have made sure to let the audience know? Another is the tank shootout I mentioned earlier in the video. I feel that blast him off the face of the earth line spoken to the mutant leader would have meant nothing if the bullets Batman were using weren't in fact fatal. I know the gang leader was at close range, his face is basically inside the barrel of the tank, but even still, Batman fired on those hordes of mutant gang members at fairly close range too. They were all younger and much smaller in size compared to the massive muscular leader. I feel that would have played a factor. A lot of those mutant gang members may have suffered life-threatening injuries too, and I doubt anyone saved them as they lie in that disgusting garbage of the dump. Can you say infection? And let's not forget to mention the countless acts of brutality by Batman in the comic as well. He kicks a guy and breaks his spine before interrogating him, saying he's young and might walk again. After defeating the Joker, he leaves countless police officers face down in the water. Unless they are wearing snorkeling masks, then I'd have to say they drowned while they were unconscious. 
Even breaking Joker's neck is a bit close for comfort. I mean, it doesn't kill him, but still. Who knows what other multitude of injuries that could have caused instead. Let's keep in mind that every character who says Batman hasn't killed in this comic are members of the media or police force. Did they know of every single person Batman came in contact with? Did they locate every one? I doubt it. If anything, all these questionable actions by the Dark Knight reinforces the battle between Superman at the end and the cause for the US government to take action against him. If he did kill, then I don't think it would have mattered. We would have found ourselves in the exact same place regardless. I mean hell, Superman even believes Batman has killed with the Joker, that's why he fights him. So yeah, does it really matter? The Dark Knight Returns came out in 1986 and was a major contributing factor in bringing Batman out from behind his campy and kid-friendly shadow of the 1960s and early 70s. The whole reason this story was so dark to begin with was to challenge the mindsets of many Batman fans, as well as the mainstream to bring about a change to his public image. DC wanted the character to be viewed upon in a more serious and adult way, and this storyline worked wonders for it. Without The Dark Knight Returns, we wouldn't have some of the best interpretations of the character we have today. With that in mind, it's one of the most important and significant stories in Batman history. Some people consider The Dark Knight Returns to be a little overrated, but once again, read it first. If you truly understand its themes, if you truly enjoy the character of Batman, I don't see why you could have a problem with it at all, unless it's due to the reasons I mentioned previously in this video. The Dark Knight Returns is my favorite Batman comic of all time. It's one of the best comic books ever written. I consider it a masterpiece in storytelling, a necessity for any comic collection.